Awesome. Uh, hello again. Apologies. You keep seeing me. Um, I promise not to speak very much. Um, hello and thank you to anyone who's able to join us live. Um, I am with the rather wonderful Dana Seagal, um, who's going to introduce herself in a second. Um, same format as this morning uh, and other calls, just a bit of a bit about Dana, a bit of blurb. And, and I promise I'm really sorry. Jasmine and Debbie from this morning. Um, I will check and keep check the lag on the chat to make sure that we actually get to answer your questions live on the call rather than me having to ask them afterwards and type them up in the Facebook group. So Dana, for anybody who doesn't know you, not that I can imagine there is anybody, um, but could you just give us a quick, what's your name and where'd you come from? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Claire. And hello, everyone. So my name is Dan Siegel. I am a fundraising and management consultant. I work with a really broad range of charities and organisations nationally and internationally, but a lot of my background and experience came from working in the arts and cultural sector, raising lots of funds and especially through trusts and foundations for amazing organisations like the Roundhouse in Camden and Cockpit Arts in London. And I'm... I'm a little bit of a sort of jack of all trades in the sense that I do a bit of major generous work as well, a bit of legacies, but really like my passion, my love, and the thing that I'm super excited about is always grant writing and trust and foundations. And I think part of the reason for that is that they She's use good. money. <laughs> yes, they use about money. They're amazing, right? And they have probably technically are the lowest resource, you know, you can sort of pull an application out quite quickly and you can get those returns within the financial year and budgetary year. So what's not to love about Trust and Foundation? So that's why I'm really passionate about it. I'm also very passionate about the people behind those decisions and, and making those decisions. And, and then also doing my bit to kind of see what we can do to make sure that they become even more friendly for us to do and better to apply for. So I've been doing a little bit of a work with the Association of Charitable Foundations on how to make grant making or grant applying more inclusive as well so that's a little bit about me awesome so um dana is our thrive trust and foundation specialist she's just told you why that's why we've asked her that's why we love her um so dana i'd like to ask you this to take the teeth in the same two questions yeah. i asked claire this morning about legacy giving so first off can you paint a bit of a picture for us about Trust and Foundations in the last 12 to 18 months and how, how we should kind of regard that in terms of whether or not we as organisations were successful in the last 12 or 18 months and should that then worry us about going forward. But just give us a bit of scene setting about the world of Trust and Foundations and how that's changed in the last 12 or 18 months. Will do. I mean, it's definitely been a bit of a roller coaster, I would say. So... <laughs> The pandemic broke out and the stock markets went do lally and I think grant makers went oh my goodness we need to do more now than we've ever done before but we also have no idea about what's going on with our investments and in our endowments so I think the start of the pandemic was a bit of a tricky one in that you had lots of funders who suddenly had to not just switch up what they were doing but also the way they were doing it you know we know that the majority of trusts and foundations in this country are family trusts, often operating in the basis of going to a room, sitting together, yeah. printing out some applications, giving them a read and deciding what they want to fund. Suddenly they're having to work remotely in different ways and, and coordinate the way that they're giving money in different ways. So there was a lot of kind of unknown, I think, at the beginning of the pandemic with trusts and foundations. But we also saw a lot of amazing effort and money coming out of the door from some of our larger established foundations who were very quick to respond and were very quick to partner with other funders to develop COVID specific initiatives. Oh no. Okay, we're just gonna give Dana a couple of seconds to refresh. Hopefully. Curse of the live Zoom call. Lucky for Dana, though, she hasn't got a full on gurning face on as she's frozen, which is always a bonus. Dana, are you going to reappear? Oh, I'm back. 
There you go. Yeah, I was just saying to anybody watching that you'd managed to pause without gurning, which is a really great, <laughs> great achievement. All right. Where did I get to? I suppose I was just talking about that it was a bit uncertain and it was very competitive, I think. And the funders coming together to work on things and yeah. yeah. Ah, got you. So that was good. So there, there was a bit of uncertainty. There was a bit of movement there. I think most people found that they were not having as much success as they were used to in terms of their rates. So it's yeah, unless it was COVID specific stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's really hard when the only not facts you're getting is even funds you've had relationships with are saying it's just the volume of applications. You know, we were only not only did we increase the fund, but we were only able to fund up to 10% of the applications. Whereas normally we could expect something much more in the region of like 25 to 30%. So I think it was a bit tough and tricky at that point, but we're in a very, very different place now. Yeah. I think what we know for sure is that the stock market's recovered and actually a lot of foundations, investments in endowments have done particularly well as a result of it. So there should be a little bit more money to be giving out in the next couple of years. I think the other thing that we know from the research that was done by the Association of Charitable Foundations is that grant makers want to sustain their level of grant giving that they did during the pandemic as they increased it. And they want to commit to being more flexible about the way that organizations spend that fund. So being less restrictive in the way that they distribute it. So as far as I'm concerned, it's a really good opportunity right now to be thinking about your trust and foundation strategy and thinking specifically about how can we move from a crisis-based narrative in our applications to one that really starts to demonstrate and say, okay, we've done some research, we've talked to our communities, here are the things that we think are gonna help us rebuild those communities, get things back on their feet and improve things for people as well. So it's a really great time, I think, to be involved with Trust and Foundations and thinking about what to do next. Awesome. In your opinion, should we, be talking I know there were lots of organizations that I heard talking last year who said they felt that they couldn't apply for COVID specific stuff because they weren't delivering yeah they were only doing what what they had done before but they were doing it differently so that it worked during the pandemic rather than it being as a direct response to the pandemic so on what basis do we reference the pandemic in any applications we make is it about how how would you recommend people do that that's a great question. I would say from my most recent experience, as in the application I was looking at this morning, <laughs> which is just part of the job, isn't it? What funders, are, most funders or some of the larger funders have now included or recommended that there is a section within your application that says, give us a little bit of context about COVID and its impact on you. Really? So I'd say it's important to do that, but not in a way that it's dominating the application anymore. Because I think what funders are also after, particularly grant givers, are saying, you know, they grant givers fund solutions. So communicate those solutions to us. Yeah. What's next about all of that? Let's not get too stuck in the cycle of explaining our context in COVID and let's talk more about what we're doing to move out of it as well. So I think absolutely make sure it's addressed, but I would say in a quite self-contained way, um, and also make sure that you're using truly using the case studies, the knowledge, the buildup of information that you've gained through the pandemic to inform or show that there is a demand for what it is that you're going to do next with, with your programs and activities. Awesome. If you are one of the organisations like those that you and I have worked with in the past, I know if you're an arts and culture organisation that literally has not been able to open its doors, how, how, <laughs> how are you suggesting people go about that how do you prove demand when the world has coped without you for 12 months but the world's coped without a lot for 12 months how are you recommending that arts and culture organizations face their new applications i think there's definitely a bit of a split in 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 the crowd if you like there are definitely people who continue to deliver activities online yeah. and yeah. oh we can this. hear you, but you're not moving. But again, you're not gurning. Well, that's good. What skills? <laughs> so what <laughs> I was saying is that I think the, there are a lot of organisations who did continue delivering yeah. activities. I think those organisations are in a pretty good place. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of the ones who did have to shut, who had to hunker down for a while, 
Depending on whether you have been talking to people in the interim or not, use a lot of that qualitative stuff in those applications saying like, I know you haven't been open, but this is why I've missed you. And, and lots of that information will really help you evidence what's needed. And I think the other thing is also just moving away from the fact that you were not open. We get that you weren't open, but guess what? You're opening now. And what's the difference that you're going to make to people's lives? So almost I want to say it's like forgive yourself a little bit if you're feeling a bit concerned about having to shut for a while or having to hunker down don't worry about it like what's next and that's people that's what people are going to want to sort because ultimately they just want to make sure that the kid down the road gets to come back in again or the lovely community group that use your spaces are able to come and meet back again in a socially distanced way so that's what's important to communicate I would say awesome if um an organization hasn't yet done trust and growth fundraising where do people start well i think the the cornerstone of good trust and foundation fundraising is in the research it's so important to start looking start creating those long lists try to be really strategic in the way that you're looking and finding out about which foundations you want to apply to yes there's the big long list of the top 300 with the most money but you need to ask yourself some better questions about how competitive you can be, whether they can fund all of the money or not. How much time is this application going to take that maybe is taking away from your other fundraising activities? Be strategic in the way that you're applying, but also in the signals that you're looking for yeah. from trusts and funders as well. Like who's involved? Have they funded stuff like you before? Is there strong affiliations with your program? What's their capacity for giving at the moment? All of those things should help you create a long list that's then a better short list, that's then a better actual prospect list as well, that when that's then mapped onto how warm or cold that needs to be as well. So the work is in the research, but it's also important not to get too bogged down in this because I know there can be a temptation to just stay at the computer and research more and more and more and never really get to the crux of A, giving them a call or B, putting those applications in. So Absolutely. yeah. That's just so essential. Okay. Uh, and a question I know I've answered a few times, but it'd be nice to hear someone else answer it. Um, the organisations that are being encouraged generally by a trustee to write one standard application and spray and pray and they're okay. <laughs> um, is there, if you have limited resource, where do you start? How do you avoid the spray and pray approach if that's what you're being asked to do? I would avoid, uh, you've got to avoid the spray and pray approach by doing the work to get to a, a prospect list where there are one or two people on that list who could potentially give you all the money that you need. Yeah. And that is much more worth putting that time and effort into because as we know, and this is so true of all trust and foundations, it's no different to individual giving or any sort of major donor work where you want to be forming that relationship as well. So if you're not putting the time, effort and energy into getting the prospective conversations right, you're not going to do a good job at applying to that trust and foundation and then not do a very good job at reporting or building the relationship. So for me, that spray and pray approach is just so gone. It's so in the past. And the other thing is that funders know when they get those sorts of applications. They do. They just know, especially if your mail merge doesn't work properly. So it's just not worth <laughs> yeah. it. It's not D in brackets trustee. Exactly. <laughs> it's not right. Um, you know, so yeah, I would always take that relationship-based approach with any people that you're working with. Always. Okay. Cool. Um, I can see I, the reason I keep looking down here is because I've got Facebook on my phone. I can see there are a few people watching live. If you have got any questions, if you want to type them in the box, and I genuinely will actually ask them on screen rather than forget to look and then type them up afterwards. So type your I don't even know why I'm pointing at my phone because I don't want you to type them in my phone. Obviously, type them in your device, whatever you're looking on. If you've got anything you want to ask Donna, um, do so in the box and I'll check. Um, so for people like lots of us at the moment who are doing reforecasting for the end of this year and planning 
and some budgeting. I'm more interested in the planning than the numbers, to be honest. Um, but what, why, where's a good place for people to start for? What on earth? You know, that whole finger in the air. What does next year look like? What should people be considering? I think it depends on your plan of activity. How much of your activity is going to be new slash evolutions of what you're doing? versus how much of it is a continuation of stuff that's fairly established in terms of your program. And I think if I was looking at it from a kind of top line planning perspective, anything that feels established and that I have existing relationships on, I would definitely be putting a lot of my energy and focus into maintaining that. Um, and then I would also be, I think from a personal choice, fairly ambitious, but also a little bit realistic about making new approaches for new pilot projects, research and development activities that are in response to coronavirus that will inspire some new trust and foundation relationships out there for you uh, to be formed. So I think budget well on what you know, build those relationships, deepen them if you can. And then if you are in a position as an organization where you're feeling ready to pilot or develop some new activities, look at what you can do from a trust and foundations perspective for that because there will be funders out there who want to see innovative new solutions to some of the problems that have arised as a result of the pandemic okay okay nice one um oh right, i've got a question on whatsapp that's interesting <laughs> um shopping list applications <sighs> do you have you do you ever Mm. recommend an approach where if you because there are those people who don't want a relationship there are those people who are just purely a po box and there's no telephone number and you genuinely can't judge them are you an advocate of going we thought you might like this or this or what what should you what's your approach to that so if it's very hard to get the information that you want definitely providing a range of options can help um, but as long as those, you need to make the bigger ones tempting. So you need to be able to say, yes, 500 quid would pay for this. But if you want to make the difference that we think you want to make, the 5,000 pound thing will enable us to do X, Y, and Z, which will bring outcomes of A, B, and C. So I think it's fine to do somewhat of a shopping list, but I think be clever in the way that you do it and make sure that you're pushing the appeal and the impact to those higher levels as well. So that if they do have the capacity to give those larger gifts, they can because they've been tempted to and persuaded to as well. Perfect. Awesome. Um, nothing on there. Um, is there anything that's happened in the last, you know, we, we, you were saying earlier about because the stock market's settled and things have slightly settled. Is there anything that has kind of hung on that has really surprised you? Is there anything that has either carried on or that people have stopped where you thought, well, I wonder why they've stopped that? Is there anything that you've seen that has kind of booked the trend or been surprising in the Trust and Foundations grant making world? Hmm, I'm gonna be a little bit cheeky here. Why not? I feel like I'm gonna call with you and that's fine. But we are seeing too many bad practices still come to light. So one of the things that's been really frustrating me is just because we've got used to doing applications with a two week turnaround or where the call for applicants goes out and they say, well, by the time we've re received X amount of applications, that's it. Doesn't mean that we'd like to continue working in that way beyond the pandemic. So for me, yeah. some of those funders who have refused to budge on that emergency time frame are really doing the sector a disservice because what we all really need is a bit of space to to think to plan to reflect and to have a little bit of negotiation and conversation with our funders about what's going to be most impactful as well so for me that's kind of where I'm maybe pushing and prodding where I can um, to try and move that along and obviously following things like hashtag fix the form uh, so my Carrie and Laura, which is just amazing, can really help with that. And they're really building that evidence base of kind of getting rid of some bad funding practices as well. Yeah, I um, had a number of 
can't remember which shine it was I ran last year, but on one there was a disproportionate amount of trust fundraisers on it who had just finished one round of crisis, COVID. And it was like, you open a fund on a Friday and it closes on a Sunday evening. How does that work? And yeah. And we know as well as writers, our mood, how tired we are, the way we feel, whatever's going on, it comes out in the writing. You can't help it. And these are not great conditions to be persuasive and creative and very clear and simple in the way that we write. And I think that we need to try and find, obviously connecting to all the work you do, Claire, those boundaries that enable us to be our best in order to then be productive in what we're doing, because we're going to have better applications when we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Right. I can't see any questions at the moment but I will keep absolutely um right I can't see I can any questions at the moment but I will keep I can hear myself and I don't want to hear myself there we go Funny. right uh okay how useful do you think it is to create a very detailed case for support that can be copy slash pasted into various applications I would say having a central source for your case is such a good idea especially if you are in a team where there is a bit of delegation and devolvement but you want to make sure that there's a consistent kind of narrative and tone of voice across the board um i'd just be wary of the phrase cut and paste because as we know we want to really tailor those and make sure that they really speak to the funders however i don't think it's a bad idea to have a consistent place for all that information and what I tend to do at the beginning of any relationship that I have with any organization is create that central document from which then there is a consistency also not just in terms of the way that we write the actual applications but clarity across the team about what the priorities are for what needs funding and from what so that again you're being strategic and very um uh focused in what you're applying for from funders as well awesome um not a question just a statement donna is the best Wayne, <laughs> sleep murray um okay jasmine how do i best communicate to our board that we need to employ a team member to research and apply for grants and trusts rather than applying as and when we can it can be a challenge to prove it's needed when we don't have huge success in funding oh that's really interesting what i would say is that often that critique or that um need to persuade comes from basically a gap of the understanding of the opportunity between you and the trustees so what i would say is are there any other organizations or friends in the sector that you can talk to who are doing that sort of research and planning and evidence that that approach is working better for them either with their success rates or the amount of money that they're bringing in or just with the workflow against other fundraising activities where you can say, this is why it works. Because I think sometimes they just don't understand, I don't understand the true opportunity that there is with trust and foundations at the moment, in which case a bit of contextual info can help. But also they don't understand the knock-on effect that that extra bit of research and planning could have on not just the rest of your fundraising activities, but also the relationships that you can then make with those funders and planning towards those deadlines as well. So I think that's, fingers crossed a bit of helpful advice that can absolutely absolutely uh all right cool just two thank yous um awesome so just because um we can do tell me a little bit about thrive and how you found it i just i love it so much i think for me as someone who used to be a fundraising head of fundraising who has done a little bit of interim fundraising directorship since i've gone freelance Even me being a part of this fundraising directors network has been amazing because it feels like a really supercharged, intimate, safe way to get the advice that you need for your organization and what you're doing. And I think, as I've said before, it can be quite lonely at the top and actually knowing that there's that group there really, really helps. So for me, it's been really exciting to be a part of Thrive. Obviously, it's amazing to be on the roster with people who I rate beyond belief as well in terms of all their other specialisms and and areas so 
I would say it's been a brilliant experience as an expert coming in, supporting people on the program to just focus, be clear and have that sounding board on what's coming up, future trends, um, but also just to witness and enjoy it for myself to kind of see all the brilliant stuff that's going on out there and, and remind people that they're awesome and that fundraising, being a fundraising director is hard, but not impossible. Um, so yeah, it's been a brilliant experience so far and I'm just really looking forward to meeting the second cohort as well. Mm, really really good I'm really looking forward to it right okay uh, Abby has just said in, in reaction to your trust and foundation she just said I'm feeling very positive listening to this which is good because that's what we we just want to foster that I think that one of the things that struck me and in one of the reasons it's thrive, thrive exists the way it does is that the thing I found being a fundraising director was you're, you're not just expected to know all these income streams, but you're expected to be an expert in them all. It's like, you can't possibly be the whole, the, the definition of expert says. Um, and I think it's great that throughout even the existing cohort, there are different people with different specialisms themselves and different. And one of the things I hadn't quite expected to happen, and yet it always makes me grin when it does, is when it's the week of the thing that you're an expert in, you enjoy it just as much because you get to nerd out about it, as John Lepp calls it, just as much as you do when it's the week where you think, I've really got, I need to get something actionable to take away from this. Mm -hmm. And there is the full spectrum of nerding out with someone who really, really gets it. And like Michelle, for example, who's a head of a team of one of herself, what is there that's actionable that I can go away and do in the next couple of weeks that's going to make a big difference in trust and foundations or in whichever area it is? And that, I think the nerding out bit, I hadn't just quite appreciated how much people were going to, were going to really love it. Okay. Um, and now I'm confident that I'm looking in the right section for questions and I can't see any more. Um, so, Dana, thank you very much. Thank you, Dana. Um, and anybody watching, um, don't forget, we have Mr. Wayne Murray, who I do believe might still be watching, um, and Zoe Amar live on a full-on masterclass tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. Um, you won't be on the Facebook chat, you'll be in the room, um, and they're going to talk to you about how do we use strategy, digital and innovation to help underpin plans for next year, why why they're the things that we can be certain of, and how to use some of that certainty, and how to... See, I don't even know what they're going to talk about. It's not my area. That's the very small snippet of stuff that I'm now blagging around. But that's what they're going to come and talk to you about live on a masterclass tomorrow afternoon. If you haven't got your spot yet, I'll put the link in the comments below so that you can get a, pl a place that, that, like I say, won't be on Facebook. That's just a Zoom call. Um, and, Dana, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I can't remember, I think Andy King is also on later on tomorrow evening doing a live like this about corporate partnerships. Um, but for now, um, happy half past three on Monday. We've made it through another Monday. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, and thank you, Dana. And take care. We'll see you soon. Cheers. Bye. Bye.